Oh, sorry, guys. <laughs> oh, that'll wake you up. The coffee didn't. All right, scaling the fragmented supply chain is our next session. Uh, our speaker is Justin Singer, the CEO of Caliper Foods, a pioneering company in the cannabinoid industry and parent company to Caliper Consumer Ingredients and Caliper Consumer Goods. We're going to take a look at the CBD supply chain from seed to sale. Justin, come on up. Thank you. All right. Are we good on levels? Um, all right. So I'm Justin Singer. This is CBD quality. Um, you'll notice my email address on this slide. Please take note because I'm about to say a bunch of stuff that is at odds with a lot of things other people will say. So please feel free to email me about it and check me on it because there are a lot of unknowns in this space and I think everybody is way too certain. Um, so go to the next one here. Um, oh, cool. Good transition there. Um, so a little bit about Caliper Foods. Uh, we are a food company focused on cannabinoids. We think that's a very important self-identification. We are not a cannabis or hemp company that has suddenly discovered that food and beverage are fun. Um, we believe cannabinoids represent a new category of functional ingredients, that it is a, it, THC and CBD are the beachheads, but we are talking about a whole category. It's not just one or two bioactives. Um, next one, please. Um, to the point of us being a food company, we have R&D run by a formal principal friend, former principal food scientist at Mars. Spent 20 years there in their new product development groups focused on the commercialization of novel ingredients like cocoa flavanols. Um, he also ran scale up for Snickers and pretty much everything else because that's what you do at that company. Uh, QAQC, run by a lab director at Eurofins in Silicon Mario. 25 years experience in food quality analysis. Finally, uh, manufacturing, run by longtime floor leaders at Safeway's National Milk Production Facility. Food, food, food. It's every, the lens through which we look through everything. Food safety, consumer safety, food and beverage, and supplement labeling. Um, next one, please. Uh, our three companies, so you just understand a bit more about the context. So we have Caliper Consumer Goods. Uh, this is the manufacturer of Caliper CBD, which is a powder, powder uh, 20 milligram CBD packet, uh, odorless, flavorless, clean label, instantly dissolves into warmer cold water, clean nutritionals, clean flavor. Um, we also have commercial ingredients where we do, sorry, it's a little strange, it's not showing up the same over here, um, where we do shelf-stable formulations of water-soluble CBD uh, to food and beverage companies who care about things like shelf stability trials, who want to do plant trials, who want to do bench top work, um, who don't just want to put out a product as quickly as possible because they're scared of missing out or want to just throw something on the market. Um, and then we have Stillwater Brands. So we got our start in THC consumer branded goods back in 2014. We were in Colorado because it was a nice regulated environment and we really like working in regulated environments. We believe that self-regulation is not a thing, that you actually do need regulation by a entity to set standards that everyone can adhere to. And Colorado had the best of that in 2014 where we could feel like we could invest safely into the infrastructure required to scale this up in a consistent way. So where does that put us in the current supply chain? Well, it's a little tough to talk about the supply chain in CBD because right now it's so vertically integrated. That's how THC started as well. But eventually in time, all supply chains segment because it turns out that doing things is difficult and it really pays off to focus. So when we look at circles of competency, we see cultivation as one, we see extraction as another, then we see ingredient processing, food, uh, product manufacturing and retailing as all separate competencies and we're sitting right there in ingredient processing and manufacture. So to us, CBD is cereal. We take it, we process it into standardized soluble formats that are ready for consumption, and then we put it into products or sell it to people who are putting it into products. So why are we talking about CBD? And I'm gonna go a little quick here because you just heard a great presentation on all of this. Um, it's because it's incredibly popular for one. Uh, this is a chart of Google Trends search interest. You'll notice there's no Y axis because it's search interest. Um, CBD, incredibly popular. More popular than Juul, more popular than DC. So for everything you hear about e-cigs, CBD is what people are interested in. It's hard to think of another uh, ingredient where things have been like this. It's also incredibly promising. 26% of US adults, according to a January survey from Gallup, have tried CBD at, one, at least once in the last two years. 
14% already consume CBD regularly, although I would argue 14% think they consume CBD regularly. There's a difference. 63% um, find it extremely or very effective for reducing strength, stress or anxiety, the prime millennial use case. 38% find it extremely or very effective for alleviating joint pain, the prime boomer use case. And what type of products are they looking for? Well, they're looking for food, vitamins, cosmetics, non alk beverages, alcoholic beverages. Funny enough, I, I think, look at the entire CBD market today, you would see a lot of tinctures, you would see a lot of capsules. Those are not really on this list, unless you want to put them under VMS, but that's a bit of a stretch. So, as an ingredient supplier, we have a lot of conversations with people where they want to know, how is this made? They have been told lots of things. They have also been told that it is a black box that they should just trust people. That's silly. Um, this is food and agriculture. You don't, there really isn't like black box IP here. I come out of tech where there is black box IP. You are all capable of understanding how CBD is produced. Here is, so what I'm gonna present here is a generic process map for how CBD is produced and what the constituent components are in it. This is again, approximations. Everybody will have a slightly different take on it, but this should give you a bit of an understanding of how it actually processed through. So, you start with hemp biomass. That goes through a crude, crude extraction or a purge. That's, the point of that is to extract oils of interest, remove extraneous material, and concentrate the lipid-based materials. And now is when solvents start becoming part of the process. What you're left with is full-spectrum hemp oil. You can take this, dilute it, and sell it as a, as a tincture that's full-spectrum and plausibly uh, certified organic, but most people do not, especially if you want to put this into a food or beverage. If you want to put it into food or beverage, you want to eliminate all those flavor profiles. You want to eliminate all the things that are non-standardized, all the things that could affect your shelf stability, could affect your product stability, could degrade. So you want to take it through a winterization and filtration step where you're trying to remove all the waxes, the chlorophyll, and improve the product stability of the overall thing. And then you need to remove all those solvents that you've been using through a solvent removal process. What's refined CBD oil? Then you go through a cannabinoid enrichment process because you've bought this expensive equipment to deal with and you don't want to put shit through that process. You want it to be nice and clean. So you try and get up the cannabinoid profiles. Um, and what's left is distillate CBD oil that can then take one of three paths. You can go through a crystallization or solvent removal. That's where you're trying to precipitate out, filtrate, filter and evaporate and get to CBD isolate. Hit it with some pentane and hexane. We are actually very fortunate that CBD crystallizes quite easily. This is a pretty, a fairly unique property. It's really nice to be able to isolate something that you're targeting in a fairly simple way. I, we don't take enough advantage of that, in my opinion. Um, or you could go through fortification and dilution. So the goal there is you want to standardize CBD content and reduce THC to under 0.3%, so you aren't dealing with the federally controlled substance, THC. And usually that involves diluting with MCT oil, but then you got to fortify with CBD isolate to get up to that CBD content. Or you can go through an isolation or reconstitution phase to get to that broad spectrum, that THC-free that everybody wants. You go through chromatography, um, hit it with a ton of salt, try and select out the things you don't want, and what you're left with is a THC-free broad spectrum. So what do these products look like at any given moment? So hemp biomass, if you're f lucky, if you've got something that's mostly female, plants that are controlled for CBD content or promoted for CBD content, you end up with the 10% CBD biomass. Take it through to the full spectrum hemp oil, you're up to like 37, 40%. Gets a refined CBD oil in the distillate. What you end up with, 85% CBD, again, it changes based on everyone's unique conditions, um, and about 6% THC. Well, that's a controlled substance. That is federally illegal. So you've got to loot it. You can either take it down to CBD isolate where you've got 99% CBD, 0% THC, and 1% of what I call the adulteration space, where it's like, what is that? We don't know, because you can only know what you're looking for. If you're not specifically looking for a certain bioactive or a certain chemical component, it's hard to say what else is in there. Uh, or you can go to the broad spectrum route, and you end up with less than 0.3% THC, 1% to 2% other cannabinoids, some terpenes, and then an adulteration space, probably made up of MCT oil, but at the end of the day, we don't really fully know. Um, and then THC-free broad spectrum, even better, you get that nice high CBD content, the adulteration space is lower, but it's still there. You don't really know what it is. So why does this matter? 
why can't you just throw CBD in a bag? Um, this is interesting. The answer to that is you can. Um, when we first started in the THC space in Colorado, we met with the dispensary owner, told him that we wanted to do a microdose tea that was designed to appeal to grandparents who wanted a functional dose, and he said, just throw a shake in a bag, man, it'll sell. That is a mentality that is all too pervasive in THC and has unfortunately crowded its way into CBD as well. But if you don't share that mentality, and since you're here and you paid to be here, I assume you don't, let's talk about why it matters to actually refine the CBD that you're working on. So first of all, value. Solubility matters. Solubility creates value. These are the results of a pharmacokinetic study that we ran with Colorado State University. This was 30 milligrams of CBD in caliper CBD, which is our powder, versus just a tincture dissolved in water. It absorbs 450% more. That is a lot more value. Now, what's really interesting about CBD, cannabinoids in general, is that these curves vary based on cannabinoids. So we ran the same study with THC last year, and THC, the observed blood levels for a third as much THC were almost three to five times higher than what you've got with CBD. CBD is poorly absorbed into the bloodstream. It's crazy when you think, look at those two and a half milligram dosages. That's hard to understand if that's anything more than the placebo, other than the placebo effect. If, when you look at how much is actually getting into the bloodstream. The thing is, consumers deserve to experience what they pay for. If you're gonna market putting a certain content of CBD into your product, they deserve to experience that in their blood as well. So like I said, when it comes to food, CBD is a raw material that requires further refinement. Why? So number one, organoleptic concerns. CBD is extremely bitter. It's more bitter than caffeine. Our food, which is the standard for bitterness, our food scientists have never worked with a compound as bitter as it is. You need other compounds that you put in there, other cannabinoids, other terpenes, they bring flavor as well. Those have to be controlled if you're going into a production environment where you spent tons of money worrying about what is the flavor profile of the end product that you're putting together. Two, food system concerns. CBD is fat soluble and incompatible with low fat water-based food systems. You gotta put it into a soluble format if you wanna give it something that is healthy and can be really consumed on a day-to-day -day basis. Three, stability concerns. UV and aluminum related degradation are real. We don't fully understand them. We've been looking at it, we are trying to understand it, but it's really hard to isolate a variable, especially can, if we don't even know what all the variables are, let alone which one is causing the problem but it requires study and it's something to be att pay attention to. Finally, pharmacokinetic concerns. Compatible CBD is absorbed into the bloodstream. We've been over this one. And now my favorite part, the spectrum problem. Um, this is where I think we diverge from pretty much the entire industry, but I'm still gonna go through this and please feel free to argue with me. Um, so, the name. Standards of identity are used to ensure that foods have characteristics expected by consumers. The information provided through food labeling must be truthful and not misleading. The consumer choices made based on this information can have important impacts on health. That is a statement from the FDA commissioner from earlier this year. The base belief of FDA is that consumers deserve to trust label equals same product. We agree. So let's start by figuring out what are the definitions that we're talking about here. So some commonly accepted definitions, and I'm just using the word commonly accepted because these are not scientific definitions that have been established by any sort of regulatory body. They're just sort of an amalgam of what we all have come to believe. So what is full spectrum? The total extract of the flower, including THC and other cannabinoids, terpenes, omegas, and plant matters. Plant matter. That's a pretty clear definition of what it is. Broad spectrum. Some people say it's the total extract of the flower with THC removed. Other people and have said that it is CBD plus one other cannabinoid. Other people, regulatory attorneys that we've dealt with, have said that it is CBD plus one other cannabinoid plus one terpene. These are all different things. CBD isolate, the chemically isolated form of cannabidiol. I like to say one of these things is not like the other. One of these things is actually a standard of identity. So let's go through all the problems here. Total extract of the flower is not a product standard of identity. For one thing, bioactive content varies by field. The same genetics will produce varying bioactive content across environments. For another, bioactive content varies by extractor. The same biomass will produce bioactive content across processors. And finally, bioactive content varies by batch. 
the same processor will produce varying bioactive content across batches. That makes total to the flower tenable as a SOI for a refinement process, how you go about getting to that final product. It's not a tenable SOI for a refinement product. More to that point. Here are the cannabinoid profiles for five different full spectrum products that we've bought from the store. They were all labeled the exact same. Consumers should have been able to trust that what was in there was the same. What was the bioactive content of these? They varied dramatically. Even more scary, Delta 9 THC was of course present in all of them. That's a controlled psychotropic substance. It is, if you are a retailer, it is the thing you should be most scared of. There is nothing worse in a consumer experience than getting somebody high who doesn't want to be high. That is the absolute worst thing you can do as a manufacturer. Putting THC in there may create some benefits, but it also runs a massive risk. So when we hear the terms full and broad spectrum, in our minds, we hear fruit salad. It's like fruit salad is different from every restaurant, from every chef, on every menu from day to day. You can go and say this fruit salad is standardized with 20 blueberries and everything else is different. That's not standardized. A term to ensure consistent characteristics. The other problem, spectrum marketing misleads consumers. Full broad spectrum hemp has been claimed to be more effective than CBD isolate. This is not something that you can say because you haven't defined what full spectrum is. What cannabinoids, terpenes, or fatty acids are you talking about? What effects? Which conditions are you talking about it being more effective for? Is fruit salad more effective than blueberries alone? The reason why that sentence question doesn't make sense is the same reason why the idea that full or broad spectrum is more effective doesn't make sense. You haven't defined it. It's claim two. Full or broad spectrum is more legal than CBD isolate. I hate this claim because it is utter nonsense. FDA has never made that distinction. Never, never, never. You don't have to believe me. Please don't believe me. Go to their website right now. They are a public organization. They are required to publish all of their opinions. They have never used the terms full spectrum, broad spectrum, or isolate. They have only ever talked or cared about cannabidiol. That is the bioactive that they are targeting. It is the only thing they care about regulating. All of the case law around Pharmanex, statins, red yeast rice, it all points to the idea that if you market it, if you promote for it in your cultivation, then it is the controlled substance. That is cannabidiol. It doesn't matter what form it takes. Right? If you want to use full or broad spectrum for marketing reasons, please go right ahead. But don't do it because you think it is more legal. Problem. Standardized CBD content, or for example of chromatography, is fortify the CBD isolate. This is the other one we keep hearing. Like, I want a, T8, I want a broad spectrum product that I can get at scale that is standardized CBD content and f does not involve C CBD isolate. The best that we can tell when we actually do our diligence into the upstream manufacturers is that that product does not exist. Doesn't mean that people won't tell you it exists. We have not been able to find it. Um, or anybody who proved to us that's how it's made. Claim, full broad spectrum CBD is more natural than CBD isolate. I don't like this claim either. CBD refinement is a solvent heavy process. It's more like petroleum refinement than olive or hemp oil processing. I think a lot of people have the idea that to get to CBD, you just take hemp, you press it, and what's, you maybe put it through a filter, and what's left is a nice pure product. That can po possibly be true for full spectrum hemp oils that are in a tincture format, and you just go straight from that full spectrum to the dilution. It's not gonna be the case with pretty much anything else. The hemp is natural to a point. The process is not. And the other problem is broad spectrum processing, the thing that's THC free that actually gets to the fear of having that psychotropic, significantly more solvents than isolation. Again, we are very fortunate that isolation is possible. This is not something, this is a technology that didn't exist 30 years ago to actually get to an isolated component at scale. That is the dream of all manufacturers is to have consistency in your input products. We should really take advantage of that. And again, more, spectrum processing deeply misleads consumers. I hate this term, spectrum. Spectrum in antibiotics refers to uncertain targets of singular bioactives. Spectrum in hemp refers to uncertain bioactives. When you hear the terms X percent CBD full or broad spectrum, you can think of that as X milligrams of penicillin plus a random grab bag of other antibiotics. 
is a misappropriation of scientific terms of art. It's not a good look. So I have said, sat here and bashed on full and broad spectrum. I just want to make one thing clear. I am not against the concept of synergistic effects between multiple bioactives. I think that is a general truth in science, that two things can have a more positive effect than any one thing alone. You just have to define what those things are at what levels and for what purpose. You define it, you standardize it. Then you can hit it time in and time out, and then we've got something that we can actually work off of from a manufacturing perspective. We have offered manufacturers a challenge for, to provide us with CBD oil that is broader full spectrum. We say, great, you call your shot. Tell us the three cannabinoids that are gonna be in there at what levels, and hit that five batches in a row. Tell us what's not gonna be in there. Nobody is bothered to try. And then here's really the scariest part. Uncertain bioactives mean uncertain health effects. This is a story from Dr. David Miari, who's one of the leading researchers on CBD, and especially as it applies to autistic children. He talks about a study where in Israel they were treating 70 kids with autism and the results were found phenomenal. But one day, seven of the kids flipped out. Called up their doctor, said, what changed? Called up the grower, said, what changed? The grower said, nothing's changed. Given them the same 20 to one CBD THC ratio extract as always. Sounds like it's the same, sounds like it's standardized. So he called the physician and asked him to send samples of their oil. And when he checked the samples, what he saw was that the underlying cannabinoids, the lessers, had all changed. The strain had changed. It was the same CBD-THC ratio. That part had been standardized. But all the other bioactives had not been standardized. They changed. And so the effect that it had on the consumers changed as well. Those bioactives are bioactive. They are real. The lesser cannabinoids can't just be discounted. You have to pay attention to them if you care about consumer effect. Standardizing the CBD content in a full spectrum, cons in a full spectrum context isn't enough. You've got to standardize the bioactive content. Those are two different things. So, if you still want to go through with Spectrum, here are some questions that you should really answer, ask yourself and be prepared to answer. How will you ensure compliance with an analytically impermeable spec? Cannabinoid content can be analyzed, can be verified, you can actually put that under an HPLC and get a response. You cannot practically verify process. That's a lot of trust. Are you already t trusting enough? How will you guard against THC encroachment without sacrificing scalability? THC removal for chromatography is a very promising technological process that is nowhere near production scale. All right, there are people who've invested lots of money in it. They are getting very good at it. I believe someday they will get there. But right now, if you're a large scale food and beverage manufacturer, I would not build a supply chain around that. You would have to be very worried. Also, it's a sort of process where the more you push through it, volume through it, the more risk you bear for TH encroachment. And now you're running schedule one drug risk. Question three, who will consumers blame when, and it's a when, it's not an if, their experience changes? By the way, this doesn't matter. Even if you use the same genetics every time, you will suffer genetic drift. We are already seeing this with a lot of companies. It happens. So you can't just say we use the same genetics every time so it's consistent. The process, the genetics, these all drift. So consume, the underlying product will change, the consumer's effect will change. Who are they going to blame? Are they going to give up on CBD or just your product? On the one hand, you could argue they're just going to give up on your product. That's probably the best case scenario for the industry. The worst case scenario for the industry is they give up on CBD. How will composition variants affect chemical, physical, or organoleptic stability? The answer to that is we don't know. And these are three words that it's really important to get used to saying. We don't know yet. There's a lot of work left to do. The CBD regulatory risk is unavoidable. This is something FDA has made very clear. We are, this industry exists at their discretion. Great. I happen to believe that this is an extremely promising industry and an extremely promising class of bioactives that are gonna be one of the largest opportunities in a generation. But if it is that great, then it needs our skepticism, not our optimism. It'll do just fine on its own. So everything else but regulatory risk is optional. So the bottom line of all of this, if you care about the things FDA cares about, accuracy, consistency, identity, consumer safety, we believe CBD isolate is by far your safest bet. And again, I don't mean to sit here and be a booster for CBD isolate, I'm a booster for consistency. This is something that is consistent and analytically susceptible. That is why we like it. And with that, come at me.
Uh, that was really sobering, but awesome. Um, any questions? All right. Um, as far as CBD isolate, I'd like to know your view on how the FDA uh, looks at CBD isolate. So we're only reading tea leaves here. FDA has done a great job of saying absolutely nothing and confusing the hell out of everybody. Um, but historically speaking, FDA is a single molecule organization. They like looking at the smallest discernible component of an active or a compound. CBD isolate is a discernible isolated component of it. I, you look at like the Epidiolex new drug application, they don't use the word isolate. It's not even an isolate, it's a refined distillate. Like, I don't know where this idea that FDA only cares about isolate came from, but it's not based in the actual record. So I happen to think FDA should take this as a gift that CBD can be isolated and controlled. We look a lot at like what's going on with vaping right now. You look at vaping, the problem isn't CBD or THC, the things that we actually care about. It's everything else that we let in in an uncontrolled fashion. So like that's when I look at full spectrum and broad spectrum, I see CBD, which is the thing that we care about and want into the food supply, and Congress wants into the food supply. And that looks safe and well studied, and the WHO has put an imprimatur on it, and I feel good about it. I can't say the same thing for everything else in there. I believe it to be good. I don't know yet. And I think FDA tends to feel in the same way, I hope. I don't know. I really, I wish I knew. I wish they would say more. Thank you very much for the great presentation. My question, the pharmacokinetics study that you did, was it in human or in animal? Animals. Human. Okay. How many uh, people? So it was only a scoping study. It was an N of five with a N of five on each experimental leg. Um, but we did see statistical power, so I feel comfortable reporting it here. I don't feel comfortable putting it on package yet. We're running a follow-up study in Q4 with a much larger N. And was it one time dose or uh, several uh, dosage, like uh, over a seven day period? No, so it was a seven day washout period, uh, and then one standard dose, 30 milligrams in water, and then blood draws every 15 minutes for over the course of six hours, 15 to 60 minutes. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody else have a question? This yeah, we're here. On yeah. Hold on. Wait, hey, look, we'll just do the mic. So <laughs> we're live streaming this baby, so. A follow-up on that one, was the diet controlled, especially the fat content of the diet? Yeah, so there was a fast period of 12 hours previous to the test, and then there was a snack that was given at night in that was a standard snack of, uh, it's like a vegetarian, um, a sausage, and something else. Um, I can, I'm happy to show you the write-up on it if you're more interested afterwards. I just had a comment. I'm a transdermal patch manufacturer, so... Uh, same vein as what you're going through, and I've got people that want to sell me CBD all day long, reach out to me, and it's just the garbage that's in the market and the misconceptions of the people that are selling the product is, is just pervasive. So I just want to say thank you. Um, I learned a lot here, and um, I hopefully can tell my customers a little bit more. So um, it's, it's just, uh, you know, they keep saying wild, wild west, but it's a, it's a dangerous wild, wild west. So you got to step carefully before you launch products. That's the only thing I'd say. Yeah, uh, thank you. Agreed. And like cosmetics or something, we're, we're running studies right now on like what are the transdermal absorption rates for CBD and different types of bit chassis. We don't know. Like right now, you go to the market and you will see two products priced the exact same, 50 milligrams of CBD, one with 500 milligrams of CBD. We have no concept of what a dose means, what it, but we just don't know. We know it's promising, but we just don't know. <laughs> Hi, Justin. Thank you for the presentation. Um, Question on the kinetic study. Mm -hmm. um, did you also uh, compare plain MCT? Uh, we did not in this trial. So this was really a process trial where we were testing the same components, one that was processed into the water soluble, one that was not. Um, we are in the follow-up study, MCT oil tincture is one of the legs. Okay, thank you. All righty, got a question over here. Thanks for the great presentation. Really interesting information. Um, one thing, mm -hmm. on August 13th, Lowell Schiller, uh, Principal Associate Commissioner for Policy at FDA, in speaking to the National Industrial Hemp Council, said, and I'll quote, I'll repeat that, under current law, it's unlawful to sell a food or dietary supplement with CBD in interstate commerce. Mm -hmm. How does all this fit together? I agree 100%. It is unlawful. I, we are doing unlawful things. I, I, 
I was up on Capitol Hill two weeks ago talking with House committees on both sides of the aisle telling them that, hi, I'm committing felonies, please help me do it in a regulated manner. Um, like I said, we exist at the discretion of FDA right now. This is, Congress has passed the Farm Act. They were, FDA has also acknowledged publicly that it is their express will and intent that this go into the food supply. There's gotta be this intermediate period where there is an allowance for the fact that people are putting this in. It is there, it is happening. It is incumbent on us to do it in the safest possible way. It is incumbent on FDA, FDA to tell us as quickly as possible how to regulate it. Um, but yes, that is a risk you're taking. That's why I say it's unavoidable with that regulatory risk with CBD. So earlier you mentioned that the distillate may contain THC. How would you recommend processors or labs handle that material? And they destroy it immediately. All of it? All the THC, yeah, that's a schedule one controlled substance. If you wanna play with THC, you should get a license in a state that has a controlled THC environment and grow plants that are high in THC. But in CBD, that is, a, that is just as illegal as it's ever been. Um, Congress has made the distinction between hemp and marijuana plants. Horticulturally speaking, they're the same plant. Um, one of them is high in CBD, one of them is high in THC, so it becomes very difficult. I know this is growers in a very uncomfortable position. The problem really is in just the way that we are defining these things, but today, once you've got a set of THC in your plant, and if you don't have a state legal license, if that's not through a seed, and seed to sale tracking system that is overseen by the state, destroy that shit. All right, I just want to mention, um, there's a lot of legal questions. The lawyers will be at the last panel, so we'll let them commit to malpractice at the end of the day. <laughs> Hi, thank you, Justin. Um, this was an amazing presentation, first of all. Um, I'm with Open Book Extracts. We're a grower and a processor based in North Carolina, and everything that you said resonates very strongly with our mission and vision, so I'd love to just catch up with you, so I'll say that aside. Cool. Um, you know, I would say on the, you know, testing and regulatory front, would just love to, you know, have your opinions on one thing that's a struggle in the industry, this might be coming up later as well, is inconsistencies in lab testing results. So we do all of our testing on site, and then you send it out to five different labs, and five different labs also produce different results. So that's like another whole area of discussion, oh, yes. which is super frustrating. <laughs> um, and on the isolate side, just to follow up on a question over on that side of the room, um, I think we're all on the edge of our seats waiting to hear what's going to come out of this um, hopeful regulatory discussion. If FDA comes out with declaring isolate a farmer grade ingredient, what are the impacts of that that we should expect? It depends what they say about everything else. Right. Yeah. <laughs> like, if they say that CBD is a farmer grade ingredient that can't be in the food supply, but like everything else in hemp is, one, that would be really a strange opinion of FDA to say like, we're going to control this one bioactive but we're not gonna control these other 100 bioactives. Those are fine. That doesn't seem in yeah, line they've, with it. They've had precedent in other categories, unfortunately, like cholesterol, so that's why we're, again, we, like this is all tea leaves, like you said, yeah. we're just trying to figure that out, but it's something that I didn't know if you were thinking about on your side too. Yeah, I mean, it's really, it's a problem of first impression, so it's really hard to think through. Um, so the question of analytical lab testing, yeah, that is a problem. Um, I think people think that that is much more stable than it actually is. You, it's even worse it's than definitely send, not. No, it's worse than even sending out to five different labs. You can send the same sample to the same lab um, over the course of five weeks and get five different results. And then you put it into a complex matrix like food, it gets even worse. Um, I think the answer there is to follow general FDA guidelines on food safety, which is don't sell products that you can't be sure while including that lab variance that you expect are above the published number that you are selling. Selling, saying that you're selling something that's 20% CBD and you know your lab testing variance from trial and error is somewhere around 3%, then formulate to 23%. Make sure you are not coming in under that number. That has always been the prime rule with food. Don't come in under. So that's the best we can do. And then like it's on us as an industry to try and refine and narrow that margin of error. And that money hopefully goes back into our pockets as we do so, because we can formulate to lower tolerances. Awesome, thanks so much. Yeah. We have time for a few more questions. Um, here we go. So my name is Jessica Wasserman. I'm admittedly a lawyer that's speaking at the end, so uh, forgive me. But I'm not asking a legal question. Yeah. So um, I've heard Lowell Schiller say the snarky following thing. CBD stands for collect better data. <laughs> you know, and I am an FDA lawyer, and I know that FDA uh, is not proactive, and this isn't really a criticism of them. I mean, we focus on CBD, but they have so many issues to deal with, and they don't view it as their job to go out there and do studies. But 
if that is the issue, that we don't have enough good data, which I think everyone seems to kind of admit, if they don't take the next step of what can we all do to get better data, I mean, can't FDA, couldn't Congress fund them to compel them to do some studies? Could the industry be doing more studies in a um, group yeah. fashion? I don't know. All of the above. Um, and God, by the way, like as a lapsed attorney, it's a very fun place for an attorney to be in this space where like there is no black letter law to look at with this. Um, no, the answer I think is FDA, they were just appropriated additional money to look at it. Um, by exercising discretion to let companies like our operate, we are trying to create and collect better data for them. We do shelf stability studies, all sorts of things like that, that we offer up to them as often as they're willing to hear us. Um, and I think everybody else is doing the same. Um, at the end of the day though, I think like both, you know, FDA and Congress both want this passed. They want this out of their hair. Neither of them wants to be responsible for it. Um, I mean, FDA has that authority to promulgate a rule that just puts this into the food supply and obviates the whole Epidiolex problem. They also created an own goal by granting Epidiolex that cert two months before they gave, before the farm bill came through. Um, so like everybody's trying to protect their own regulatory fiefdoms and get this into the food supply and not be blamed if something goes bad. Um, so when they say collect better data, I'm like, that's an easy thing to say to defer regulations. It's also honest and accurate. Like we need more data. So if I were them, I would find a limited way to get this into the food supply, which is what I hope they do, which is just say like, okay, CBD only in the food supply, don't do anything else. Let's evaluate this for two years. And then we can come back and talk about a larger scale, uh, a larger scope of what to do with additional cannabinoids going forward and what to do with CBD in general going forward. But you need to get it out into the market in a limited way. I would just try and remove all of the potent, all of the thing, unknowns as much as possible. Hey, Justin. <laughs> um, with regard to standardization in the supply chain, where do you guys control for that? Do you do that at the biomass level and where and how? So we control, we buy the isolate. We don't actually cultivate or extract. We just buy isolate or full spectrum, but we have a very long set of specifications that covers everything from residual solvent. Basically anything you can measure in a lab is on that specification along with a method and a level of quantitation that we demand. Um, we look at that isolate as the commodity. Like that is the thing that actually, if you're a farmer, you can take it to market and like you can get a price based on what that is going to be. And that's something that each person's, if it meets a certain spec, is all within the same band. So that's our cr critical control point for quality and, uh, inbound ingredient. I was just wondering if you guys are pursuing uh, self-affirmed grass? No, um, we are not pursuing self-affirmed grass. I think self-affirmed grass is one of those things, like grass is an FDA concept. Self-affirmed grass grew out of like a letter that were actually publicly endorsed by FDA. And I just worry it's a lot of money so that our customers could claim that we told them that this was generally recognized as safe, which is really FDA's job. Um, I not here to tell people, I, I'm not here to give people to own all of their liability for working with this product. We believe CBD is safe, we sell it, we do it, they should keep that as well if you're on your own accord. Um, yeah, I, uh, this also goes with my belief that like self-regulation isn't a thing, like that is really FDA's job. That was a great uh, session again.